Welcome back. So now we are moving already to part four. It's the getting, it's really elapsing, elapsing very fast once we start the semester. So we are going to look at distributed file systems. So, so far we've uh, rehearsed relational databases, right? So PostgreSQL, SQL, and so on that are monolithic. They are on a single machine. We looked into scaling out, right? The idea that instead of a single machine, you now have a whole cluster of machines. We saw that while scaling out, we now can store a very large number of objects or key values, right? Uh, in this model, the key value model, notes that the key value model is both for object stores and key value stores, right? Both with S3 and with Dynamo, we have the key value model. However, be careful because even though it's the key value model for both, when you say key value store, you really, really mean the one that has low latency with smaller values, right? People would not call S3 a key value store because the, the objects are, uh, are too large for that. But nevertheless, it has a key value model, right? It's the idea that you assign keys to values. Um, now, we can use that, this kind of storage, as our drive for uh, storing data sets. So what's typically going to happen when you start querying data and uh, extracting information from data is that you will have the raw data that might come from sensors or from CERN. Maybe that's what you accumulated while letting the particles collide with each other. So this is the raw data. And at some point, you're going to execute queries and you're going to get derived data, right? That's basically a, a modification of the data that you wrote with your own code and you have derived data. Now is the question, where does the derived data go? Especially if it's also petabytes of data. And the answer is, it goes back to the same kind of storage medium as the raw data, right? So maybe the raw data was on S3, and you can also write back the derived data to S3, right? So I'll come back to that later when you actually look at the system that processes the data. But the idea is really that you read the data from cloud storage, for example, and you write it back to cloud storage, right? Um, but the thing is, there's big data and big data. And what I mean with that, in order to oversimplify, you can have huge amounts of large files, maybe, in your data, or you, have, you can have a large amount of huge files. And actually, it does make a difference with the architecture that you're going to use. That was too fast. Yeah. So what I mean with huge amount of large files is billions of terabyte files, right? So I, I'm thinking of a Netflix series uh, as a worldwide service stored on uh, uh, S3, that's called object storage, right? So billions, because again, it's all over the world, everybody uses the same storage medium. Versus what we are going to look at today, we, where it's more like millions of petabyte files. So the files can be much, much, much larger, but it's less files, right? This file storage is not going to be a worldwide storage system like S3. It's going to be something you put on your own cluster and that you're responsible for, right? Or Amazon can create it for you, but it's still yours, right? So this is your own local uh, file storage that can store millions of petabyte files, right? So again, I repeat, what's on the top is what we did last week. That's basically uh, Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage. What we look at today is file storage, that's millions of petabyte files. So again, to really order this and, 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 and uh, make it tidy uh, in your minds, when we have Amazon S3, we have a key value model, flat, no hierarchy. The slashes are only in the UI, but they are not really part of the, of the model, right? The key is just flat. And that's called object storage because you have these black boxes of up to five terabytes. But now what we're going to look at has a file system. We will see it does have a hierarchy with directories and files, right? So no longer a flat key value model. And there will be block storage in the sense that we will make the blocks important, just like the blocks on your hard drive, right? The four kilobyte blocks that you have uh, on, your, uh, on your laptops. So this is where this is going. Um, this all started actually in the 2000s, right? Uh, 2004, roughly, at, uh, at Google, they started noticing that they have trouble storing the data and there is no technology that allows storing uh, data on larger drives, right? So they hit the limits of a drive. And so they thought, okay, we need a way to simulate an enormous drive, but just spread over machines, scaling out, right? You can have a thousand machines. And we need to simulate to make it look like it's a single file system that the user 
doesn't really feel the difference between a, a file system on a computer and a file system on a cluster. They called it Google FS, GFS, right? The Google file system. Um, now, it's not as easy as it seems because some things change. For example, if you have a laptop, it might crash once in a while. Some of you probably had crashes where you lost data. Some others never had the problem, right? It might fail. But when you have a cluster that has hundreds or even thousands of machines or even tens of thousands of machines, it's not a question of if it will fail. It's a question of when it keeps failing. You have people that are hired full time in the data center that just run everywhere and replace the uh, the, the parts that uh, that crash. Right? You, you you need people just for that. So they will fail, and that means that when you design the system, you have to take this into account. Now you probably already have a few ideas of what we can do based on what we did uh, today and last week. For example, replicating the data. If you store it at multiple locations then you can recover from crashes, but that I'll come back to. Okay, So we want a system that is immune to that. Even if the machines crash once in a while, it continues to work. So the first thing you do, you need is an, uh, the, a way to monitor the crashes so that you're aware, right? You detect the errors. And then you need a way to automatically recover from these errors, right? On the fly, because they happen all the time and to make it Fault tolerant. So it means that it's automatic. You don't need people to replace uh, what has crashed. It should continue to work. And when people replace the, the, the hard drives with new hard drives, then you just continue to work with even more hard drives, right? But the recovery has to be automatic, no human intervention, right? It just has to continue to work. Um, another feature. So now I'm listing just the requirements of what we want. Another feature of uh, the system has to do with random access uh, versus um, scanning files and so on. So it's basically called the access pattern. If you work on your laptop, uh, you use, I don't know, um, uh, uh, spreadsheet software or whatever, or you, you're basically editing files, you can access your files anywhere on the hard drive, right? The, the disk is made for that. It's made for random access. So you can just access the data anywhere, might have a bit of latency, you know, for the disk to rotate, but it's actually created for random access. You can read and write everywhere. Do we want that for our distributed file system? We could, right? We could say, okay, yes, I want it to have random access. But in fact, in big data, we don't really need random access because what does it mean, big data? It means we download the data, we put it somewhere, we write it down, and then we process something in parallel, then we write the output. But when you write the output of your query, you don't need random access. You just write it down, right, from the beginning to the end. So it's something linear, right? You just open a new file, write it down in the order in which you store the bits, and then you're done. That's absolutely not random access. So to the question, do we need random access for our file system that we intend to use for querying data, right, analytics? The answer is no, we do not need random access. That's actually great because that makes it easier to, def to design the system if we don't need random access. So the system that we are going to design is going to be very bad at random access. If you try to use random access, it's going to be very, very slow and inefficient. We want it to be efficient if you scan data, if you scan through the data, or if you write a file from the beginning to the end, that we want to be very efficient. Uh, we also want it to be efficient at appending data. You have a file and you want to write at the end of the file. I think of a log, right? If you have a log, you just keep writing at the end, right? So this is also something that we would like to do to the data. Uh, why do we want that? Well, think of the use case. Where do they, the, does the data come from? It could come from sensors, from the our collider, the LHC, from logs, and so on. This is data that just flows into the system, right? Every second, you just create new data. So you want your file to basically be appendable, that you keep adding and adding and adding data, but this stays immutable. Once you have writing it, written it, it's immutable. But you still want to add new uh, data appending at the end. Think of, I don't know, Meteo Suisse with sensors, with temperature and uh, pressure and so on. You just keep adding every second uh, to your data. Okay? Intermediate data is also going to work that way. We just keep writing the outputs. For intermediate data, you will understand that after we have studied MapReduce and Spark, right? So for now, you just have to take my word for it, but you will see later that the same goes for intermediate data. Okay. Uh, furthermore, we have the requirements 
that this whole thing with uh, scanning data and appending data has to still work if hundreds of people doing it at the same time, right? So if you have hundreds of people, maybe all your sensors that are collecting the data, they all write at the same time, it has to work, right? Notes that I said hundreds, I did not say millions or billions, right? So this is again, not a service at the scale of the entire planet global that everybody accesses like S3. This is just a service. Let's say you have a company and this is a company sized cluster, right? So every company has their own cluster like this. So it's going to be the employees of the company that really connects to this, uh, to this system. So let's say hundreds of, uh, of people as an example, okay? Uh, and that's atomic in the sense that it's all or nothing, right? You, you just append the data you want to append or you don't do it at all. So this is one more requirement. We'll have, yes, we'll have a few minutes to the break. Let me tell you one more design goal. Um, you remember that two weeks ago, I told you about capacity throughput latency, right? And I showed you how it evolved between the 50s and uh, today, that the capacity increased a lot, the throughput, a bit, but not as much, and the latency even uh, dropped a bit less than that. Um, so this throughput and latency, this idea of throughput and latency are absolutely fundamental when you consider big data systems. So as a reminder, throughput, you imagine the bits that are flowing through the network cable, right? This, this is just the, the bits flowing around. The latency is idle. You wait, nothing happens, and you have to wait, right? So this is latency. So when you want to download data from the internet, you're going to experience a bit of latency, right? For a few milliseconds, nothing happens. And then you have data flowing around. So you have two measures. You have the number of milliseconds that you wait in latency, and you have the number of bytes per second that flow over the network. Now, very often, one of these is going to be the bottleneck. Right, so either it's the latency that is the issue because the, the download is very fast, but it's the latency that keeps you waiting, or the opposite, it's the throughput that's going to uh, to be the, the, the bottleneck and the latency, uh, it's immediate, right? So you basically spend your time uh, flowing bits through the cables. Well, it's the second kind of system that we want with the uh, HGFS, with the distributed file system. We really want it, if you look at the system in a normal, uh, cruise mode functioning, what you want to see is data flowing through the cables. This is what you want to see. What you do not want to see is nothing flowing on the cable and everybody waiting for data to flow. That would be latency. That is not what we want. So just to give you an intuition, it will become even clearer later when I, I've showed you the details of AGFS, right? So we want to optimize by having as many bits as possible flow over the cables uh, where to, to basically uh, uh, use everything we can from the network bandwidth. Okay, so this is again just a reminder of what I showed you uh, two weeks ago with these three, right? And uh, what we are going to be doing in the end with this system, we are going to parallelize in order to solve the, 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 the discrepancy between capacity and throughput. And we are going to batch process to solve the, uh, the problem with a uh, latency and throughput, but this I'm keeping for later, right? So parallelism, you will see already with MapReduce, probably batch processing, we'll see with uh, HBase, right? So white colon stores. So at that point, it's really a high level thing. I will take the time to go through this and give you all the details of how this is actually working. Just checking the clock so that it, yeah, maybe it's going to ring in one minute. Um, just tiny thing. So Hadoop is an open source version of the same thing. Right, it's the same thing that was done at Google. It was done two years later, I think it was at Yahoo. Uh, and uh, Hadoop is the name of the uh, the, the, the elephant uh, uh, um, uh, teddy bear. It was initiated in 2006, and it's made of three components, the file system, GFS, they called it HDFS for Hadoop, uh, MapReduce, which we will see in a couple of weeks, also called Hadoop MapReduce in the Hadoop version, and Bigtable, which is called HBase in, uh, in Hadoop, right? So they, they just renamed them differently. But this is really just an open source version of the proprietary software. We don't see it. This is proprietary to Google. But this was the, uh, the open source. And we are going to use the open source uh, version. I think I should stop because it's going to, to ring. Uh, we will have a presentation by the, I think it's the Analytics Club, right? Do we have the analytics up here? Yes. Okay. Maybe they will come uh, when we when we open the door. Uh, 
All right. So if you are interested in the analytics club, then you can stay here. They will uh, present during the break. Otherwise, feel free to go for some coffee or, uh, or drink or whatever. So see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>